Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin and new Wild Root Liquid Cream Shampoo. Sam Spade Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Uh, you've heard of pulling a rabbit out of a hat? Yes. Well, I pulled one out of a pickle. What happened, Sam? What happened, she asked. Well, goodbye. Oh, don't go, Sam. Don't you feel like talking about it? Frankly, no, but it's expected of me. Uh, sharpen a carrot, roll me some rabbit punch, what? get the hutch ready, for I'm about to hippity-hop through the door with the load on and the flopsy, mopsy, and cottontail caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, Mother, if you get a special thrill out of buying things the whole family can use, then stop at your drug or toilet goods counter for a big family-sized bottle or tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite family hair tonic. Dad, Junior, Sis, yes, and you yourself, Mom, will find Wild Root Cream Oil ideal for grooming the hair neatly and naturally, for relieving dryness and removing loose dandruff. So, Mom, ask for it tonight or tomorrow for sure. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! What's the meaning of this? Of what? My desk and my chair shoved over to one side of the office. To make room for the other desk and the bookcase. There'll be no other desk and no bookcase and no anything else. I thought you... Don't were... say it. Don't even think about that, Nanny. You understand? Oh. It's deliciously silent in here, don't you think, Eff? Sam, weren't you and he supposed to go Stop. in... Stop! Effie, would you like to have your mouth dry cleaned? No, Sam. I'm sorry. I spoke harshly, forgive me, but the past hours have taken their toll on my nerves. Perhaps I should unburden myself. We'd all feel better. All right, Sam. Unburden yourself. I'm still in command here. Oh. To Mrs. Wellington Van Cleve Montague, Knob Hill, where else? City. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. What else? Subject, the Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper, or how Fritz Crockett saved the day. My dear, dear Mrs. Montague. It all began Thursday afternoon when I entered my office and discovered a tall, wiry young man sitting in my chair with his feet up on my desk and sampling my office bottle. Hi. The pose was so familiar for a minute, I thought it was me. Hello, Sam. I'll be with you in a minute. Have a seat. Thanks. I think I will. The one you're sitting in. You see, the detective sits in that seat and the clients sit over there. Well, that qualifies me for this seat, then. I'm a detective. I see. Well, uh, the detective we like in this office is Sam Spade, see? He pays the rent, he hires the secretary, he earns the money, and he sits behind his desk. Now, on your feet. Okay. But with two detectives around here and only one detective's chair, it's going to get a little crowded. Mind if I have a drink? Out of my glass? Oh, sure, sure. Here. You know, we'd better make a note to get another glass, too. Mm. And some scotch. I don't care much for that bourbon. No self-respecting detective drinks scotch. And uh, put this down. We'll need another desk and a uh, new paint job and these walls. Oh. Uh, I think something bright. Robin's egg blue, maybe. Mm. Soothes the nervous clients. And a bookshelf. Uh, you got that, Effie, dear? Or am I going too fast? Oh, I'll put it all down, Chris. Desk, paint, bookshelf, scotch. Et too, Effie? Uh, she's a doll. Wait a minute. That's my line. 
After I work with you a while, Sam, you'll appreciate me. So long. I'm great. Bye. You need me. Why? Because we'd be an unbeatable team. With my talent and your luck, we couldn't miss. Luck? Ever hear of Fritz Crockett? Chicago Fritz Crockett? Yeah. Never heard of him. Oh, Sam. Look, you're making a mark in your hometown. Now, why do you want to work for me in San Francisco? I lost my license in Chicago. Got caught on the hot side of a political battle. Worked for the losers, and the winners framed me for my license. Oh, gee, tough kid. That's I tough. I can't kid. get a license in any state until I clear that mess up. And so I have to work under somebody else's. Failures, but why me? Because I've kept my eye on you, Sam. I like the way you're developing. I think you could work well with me. Gee, thanks. Well, uh, your application's received. Now, uh, give me a couple of years to think it over. What's huh? the matter, Sam? Afraid I might cut your reputation in town? You found me out. But anyway, bye. Chicken, huh? Look, you want to compare a scrapbook sometime? A really good detective's got to be an actor. I play any style. Listen, we're following a Russian countess to recover Gorky's original manuscript of the Lower Depths. I meet her in the lobby of the St. Mark, disguised as an itinerant caviar salesman. Countess Natasha Mishikov. Oh, here in San Francisco, my dear. How long has it been? Eight years, 12 years. Have you forgotten little Andreev so soon? Uh, Andreev, Andreev, sorry, sorry, no casting today. Well, look, you gotta be an actor, Sam. Look, we're dealing a mortal blow to the gun-running career of Don Jose Ortega Sanchez, the notorious bandit king. Oh, well. Don Jose, you have run your last... Peace, love in border countries. Yeah. I am powerless to prevent your execution. <laughs> Die like the proud Spaniard you are. Cigarette? Uh, Fritz, for heaven's sake. I you... help you, Sam. Look, you've been captured by a mutinous crew off an English tramp steamer, and I burst through the door. Get your blooming bloody hands off that man. This one I can do myself. Off a mo, Tigger. I don't know exactly why I sat there listening to the guy, but I did. He was a sort of a one-man theater guild. He ran through 28 dialects, played a scene in which James Mason and Montgomery Cliff were trapped by an Armenian rug merchant and were saved by the voice of Gabriel Heater on the radio. Then he played all four of the Marx Brothers arguing with the Andrews sisters. Then, after the intermission, he told me a little bit about himself, regaling me with spine-tingling accounts of his Frank Merriwell-type achievements on the football field, in professional boxing, and hockey. It was pretty thrilling stuff, but nonetheless, I was about to usher him out when he came up with a particularly good bit of dialogue. I have a job for us. Yeah, well, so... John, where? Yesterday, Sam, I met an old friend from Chicago. She remembered me from an important cocktail party. Saved it for her, the party. Everyone was absolutely dreary until I became de rigueur with a brace of amusing anecdotes. The, the, the job, Fritz, the job. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, she wants us to guard a valuable hunk of jewelry at a party tonight on Knob Hill. What's the money? A hundred apiece, plus mingling with notch dancers and all the caviar we can eat. Well, well, it's better than I expected. In fact, Now, I here's have... what I want you to do. Well, wait a minute. What's this here's what I want you to do? This is the Sam Spade Detective Agency, named so because Sam Spade is the man who gives the orders around here. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, this is a costume party, and we have to wear costumes. It's in the deal. Good. I'll break your leg, and you can go as the man who came to dinner. Sam, I already have the costumes. What? Right here. Crockett, what would you have done if I didn't go with you? <laughs> the thought never entered my head, Sam. What are the costumes? Sam, 100 clams apiece is a lot of dough, isn't it? Agreed. You are about to confront the reason we are being paid so much. What is that? Your costume. You are to go as a rabbit, a white rabbit. Here's the suit. Oh, and here's the head. Notice the shocking pink ears. No, the deal's off. It's been swell for Now, wait a minute. I am also going as a rabbit. See? You will go as Flopsy, and I will go as Mopsy. I will not go anywhere dressed in that ridiculous outfit. One hundred dollars, Sam. I will... Well... Sam, let's talk this over. Now, look, I will talk to you as a businessman might talk to you. Now, Mr. Spade, you take your ordinary type detective, and you have got it pretty solid, Susan. <laughs> We talked and talked, and around 8 o'clock that night, I found myself still talking and walking up the steps of your Knob Hill mansion, Mrs. Montague, cleverly disguised as Flopsy the Rabbit, paw in paw with Mopsy Crockett. My headpiece covered everything but my eyes, nose, and mouth, and I was grateful for that. When I passed the doorman, I was tempted to say, ah, what's up, Doc? But uh, Fritz said it ahead of me. He walked in as if the, this were his personal hutch, and you, Mrs. Montague, cruised over to us. Here, my little bunny twins, aren't you both just darling? Yeah. Which one of you is Mr. Spade? Uh, well, I'm Mr. Crockett, Mrs. Montague. Mopsy. You remember me from the Nesbitt soiree, Ronnie and Benita, or uh, maybe it was Gypsy introduced us, Nespa? Oh, yes. 
Oh, and Flopsy here must be Mr. Spade. I've always wanted to meet him. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Montague. I am the straight man. How do you like my costume? Well, There's not another one like it in town. I'm, I'm the only wood nymph in San Francisco. The trains will swoon. They will. Oh, uh, you... Uh, Mrs. Montague, perhaps you'd be disposed to outline our job. Well, of course, Mr. Uh, uh, Crockett. Uh, myself, Mrs. Arlington Trippett McGill, and the famous Spanish artist Julio de Riego are going to pick the woman with the most fascinating costume. Search no farther. It could be no one but you. Flatterer! Oh. I'm not eligible. Oh. Then, at 10 o'clock, we will have the grand parade. The winner will leave the parade wearing a small jewel-studded crown. Oh, it's darling. Diamonds and emeralds and all sorts of amusing things. Well... This crown once belonged to Josephine of France. Imagine. Uh, Mrs. Montague, I hate to be an old killjoy, but are we here to uh, guard the crown? That's right, Flossie. I mean, Mr. Spade. Oh, sorry. Right. Oh, of course, I don't expect any trouble, but it's so valuable. I can't take any chances. My husband picked it up in Iran. He's in pickles, you know. Well, you know best. Uh, where is the crown now, Mrs. Montague? Oh, in a wall safe in the master bedroom on the second floor. Here's the combination to the safe written down. I'd uh, rather not have the combination, if you don't mind, until it's time to get the crown. Oh, now, don't you be silly, Mr. Spade. Except for the crown, there's only fifty or $60,000 in the safe. Oh, well, if that's all Now, the I... safe is behind the Degas original. Now, until I need you, go and enjoy yourself. Well, we'll go. Maybe I'll even let you dance with little me. <laughs> Fritz and I synchronized our watches and decided that until we were needed, we would lose ourselves in the crowd and keep our big rabbit ears open. Everybody was masked and loaded, and it was all very gay. I brushed elbows with pirates, Northwest Mounted Police, unmounted, a gorilla, an Arabian princess, four Pocahontas, and a sort of historical characters from Julius Caesar to Mike Romanoff. While I was dipping a carrot into the punch bowl, a girl made her way over to me. I knew it was a girl immediately. You could tell. I uh, tag her as a burlesque queen, but uh, she didn't talk much like it. Are you an he-bunny or a she-bunny? Uh, I'm a he-bunny. Would you like to dance with me? I'd be delighted. Who are you? Uh, I'm not supposed to tell until the mask come off. Uh, for now, just call me Flopsy. Flopsy? How cute! <laughs> you Americans have the cutest ideas. Yes, uh, speaking of ideas, uh, what do you represent? Oh, I am a folie bergère dancer. Do you like me? Well, from where I stand, it would be next to impossible to dislike you. <laughs> Such a sweet compliment. Uh, believe me, it was easy. Uh, uh, tell me, have you uh, been in this country long? A few weeks. My family has sent me on a tour of America. I see. I am here as a guest of Monsieur Montagu. Now tell me, you are a detective, are you not? As much as I regretted doing it, I hastily detached myself from Miss Foley's Berger of 1949. How she knew I was a detective puzzled me. I saw Crockett talking with a paunchy red devil and a middle-aged Christopher Columbus and stopped by. Uh, they were big businessmen, obviously, and so, so was he. Well, now, you take your ordinary harsh tape of breeze, if he oh, double duty the poison every time. It was impossible to interrupt him, so I moved on. Finally, I sat down to rest in a dim corner of the library, and I no sooner did than a large green pickle with two bandy legs sticking out of it sat down beside me. Want to bite a pickle? Uh, uh, no, thanks. No. Go ahead. It's free. I only eat carrots. Thank you, just the same. I suppose you know who I am? Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know. Well, I shouldn't tell you, but I'm lonesome for somebody to talk to. Yeah, my well, wife's dancing with another man. Sometimes I think she only likes me for my money. I find that hard to believe. Uh, I have millions, you know, just millions. I'm Horace Montague, the pickle king. I've sold more pickles than any living man. Congratulations. You like my costume? I uh, never smelled anything like it. Uh, I came this time as just an ordinary new pickle. Sometimes I come as a dill, sometimes I come as a gherkin. How jolly. Once I came as a sweet-sour mixture, yeah. and I got very confused. Yeah, well, that's up to you. I guess all I really have is my money, but I get tired of being so rich. It was fun in the early days. I was a pioneer, you know. You uh, started, I suppose, with just a wart. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's very funny, very funny. Yes, well, uh, keep laughing, Horace. I have to be running along. Thank you for talking to me. I was beginning to feel like an extra in Alice in Wonderland and headed back for the solace of the punch bowl. I saw Mopsy Crockett standing with a foolish Berger dancer and went over to him, but he suddenly turned and hopped away faster than I could hop after him. Why the coyness, I couldn't understand. When I finally caught up with him, ten minutes later, he was waltzing with Anne of Austria, who was hanging on his every word, and that was a lot of hanging. Darling, until you've 
roasted my Lebkuchen. You have the, the spirit of Goethe, Schiller, Heine, all baked in one Kuchen. <clears throat> Mind if I cut in? If you must. I mean with the other rabbit. Uh, come along, Mopsy. Well, of all the three. Uh, excuse me, darling. I come later back. Hello, Sam. What do you hear from the mom? The idea of avoiding me. Me? Avoid you? Oh, I don't know what you mean. Crocker, don't you remember just ten minutes ago my chasing you all over the floor? So help me, I don't. Oh, there you are, my little bunny. Yeah, here we are, Mrs. Montague. All right, you can give me the crown now. I'm almost ready to announce the winner of the costume contest. Uh, we haven't taken it out yet, Mrs. Montague. You have it? Well, you just said you were going to get it. I didn't. Did you, Fritz? Not I, Flopsy. Now, Bunny, stop playing jokes. One of you came up to me a couple of minutes ago and said you lost the combination to the safe, so I gave it to you again. You said you were going to get the crown. Now, where is it? I don't know, but let's find it. When we arrived in the master bedroom, the worst had happened. The Degas original was down off the wall. The safe had been opened. Believe it or not, the fifty or $60,000 habitually kept in it wasn't even touched. But you, Mrs. Montague, weren't worried about the cash. Oh, it's not there. The Josephine crown is gone. Oh, this is frightful. What will Horace say? We're sorry, Mrs. Montague. You're sorry you were supposed to guard it. It's your fault. Maybe you stole it yourself. Mrs. Montague, we did nothing of the kind. I distinctly remember saying you were going to get it, and I did give you the combination uh, again. I know. Uh, oh, it's uh, Horace. Uh, Horace, what happened, hubby uh, dear? Uh, I was walking down the hall, and a bunny came running out. Dragged me into a room, made me take off my pickle. Oh. He hit me on the head with something, and he took off his bunny suit, jumped right into my pickle, and ran off. Oh, my head. Crockett and I dashed down the hall to the room the pickle king had abdicated. On the floor was the limp, unfilled costume of a rabbit. The Montague's party not only had a flopsy and a mopsy, but it also had a thieving cottontail. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the new 25-cent Get Acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men... And women and children, too. And now, back to the Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I left Fritz Crockett and you, Mrs. Sam, attending to Horace in your master bedroom and pounded down the stairs through the guests and out the front door. I was standing there wondering where to pick up the tracks of a rabbit turned pickle when I saw the Foley's Berger dancer come running out of the Montague mansion through a side entrance and enter a taxi. I jumped into another cab and followed it, divesting myself of my Flopsy costume en route. She went almost to the west end of O'Farrell Street and entered a shabby gray apartment house. I followed. I knocked on every door until I found hers. Yes? Uh, it's me, uh, the he bunny, Flopsy, remember? Why did you follow me here? Voila, because you're so beautiful. May I come in? No. Thanks. I said no. Did you not hear me? Yes, but have no fears. I'm bonded. Uh, how did you know there was a detective, a detective's heart beating under my rabbit suit? I am not going to answer. You have no right to come in here. Come on, huh? Uh, I think I overheard somebody say this. Now, if that is all you wanted to know, please go. Why did you leave the party early? Because it bored me. 
I thought America was not a police state. Why am I being questioned? Because somebody stole the Josephine crown that belonged to Mrs. Montague, you see. I heard that it was stolen, and I am delighted. But I did not steal it. What's your name? Charmaine Roger, and what is yours? Sam Spade. Why are you so happy that the crown was stolen? Because it does not belong in the ugly home of a rich American party giver. Uh-huh. A childish woman who thinks only of her social position and her money. Mm-hmm. Where does it belong? In France, where it was made and where it was appreciated. I see. How much is it worth? In money, almost 52 million francs. In sentiment, more than one can say. Now, will you leave me You're alone? You're saying that the crown means more to a Frenchman than money, hmm? How would you like it if your Abraham Lincoln's death was being used by some French businessmen to serve cocktails over. I get the point. I tell you again, I do not know what happened to the Josephine Count tonight. Do you believe me? Hmm. I did, but only because when she left the party, she wore only her costume, and that costume wouldn't have hidden... Uh... Well, she couldn't have had it on her. I uh, went a block up the street, picked up a cab, and sat in it until she came out five minutes later. She was now in street clothes and carrying an overnight case. She drove to Castle Street, and I followed. She went into a restaurant called La Parisienne. I waited a discreet moment, then went in. She was nowhere to be seen. But a tall, lean, black-haired individual approached me with a menu in his hand. Good evening, monsieur. I regret to say that we are just closed. I'm not interested in meeting you. Where's the girl who just came in? Girl? In here? Don't dummy on me. She walked right in here 30 seconds ago. Brown hair, red coat. Charmaine Roger by name. You have made some mistake. You can see there is no one here. I have made no mistake. Now complain, will you? Monsieur, complain yourself, please. Let me go. No girl came in, but if one did, there is no place to hide but the kitchen. All right, then show me the kitchen. Monsieur Bernot. Monsieur. Oh, oh, my. Spade. Well, it didn't take you long to get here, Mr. Montague. Well, I... uh, Don't move, Mr. Spade. I have a knife at your neck. Yes, I feel it. Shall I take care of him, Monsieur Montague? No, Bernot. Put down your knife. Thanks. Mr. Spade and I will sit down to the table and talk quietly. You can go. As you say, monsieur. But I will keep out an eye. Let's keep an eye out. Sit down, please. Uh, Spade, while you're here, I have a personal matter to take up with you. About the Josephine Crown? Yes. Well, I'm sorry to report that as yet I haven't found it. Good. I'd be happy if you never found it. Oh? Does uh, Mrs. Montague know you feel this way? No, and I'd be equally happy if she didn't know. Mm -hmm. In other words, you want me to stop looking for it. That's the idea. Oh, you could make a pretense of trying to find it, but no more. That's interesting. I'll pay you a good fee if you'll do this for me. Why don't you want it found, Mr. Montague? Uh, Well, I'll talk to you man to man. Please do. Uh, A a French girl showed up in town. Charmaine Roger? Well, you've seen her. Quite a bit of her. Uh, At the party. Uh, Well, she's young and beautiful and... To the edge of the point, I was indiscreet. I see. She turned out to be more designing than I realized. A black man? Of a sort. She didn't want just money. She wanted the Josephine crown. And uh, you let them steal it? Well, I told them I'd get them into the party and furnish them a car, and the rest is up to them. Why didn't you just give them the crown? Well, I couldn't. My wife values it too much. It's her prized possession. She even wears it around the house when just the two of us are there. Oh, that's cute. Now, will you forget about this space? I'm afraid not, Mr. Montague. I'm hired out to your wife, who asked me to guard it. I did a bad job, so it's up to me to get it back, you see? No, Spade, I... I can't afford a scandal with that girl. Well, you'll have to work that out for yourself. Very well. I'm sorry. I must admit, Mrs. Montague, I underestimated your husband. For at that point, he produced a gun out of thin air and very professionally relieved me of mine. He called the proprietor, Bonneau, who appeared with Charmaine Roger. They held an immediate kangaroo court. Sentence was about to be pronounced when the front door burst open and in swept a tall character in black beret and cape and sporting a handlebar mustache. Uh-huh. Prominently pinned on his cape were a brace of French war medals, including the Croix de Guerre and so on. His entrance held everybody bug-eyed, including me. Keep him out, Judge Spade. Oh, what a joyous, charming gathering have we here. Oh, the glow of warm friendship fills the room like a cottage fireplace in Alsace-Lorraine. Ah, no, it cannot be. Can I believe these weary eyes of mine? Is it not truly my intime ami, Monsieur Montagu? Uh, I, uh, mm-hmm. I kiss you on both cheeks in happiness. Uh, who is uh, I, I don't seem to remember. Oh, but you have not so soon forgotten me. We met at the legation in 38. Oh, those years. Do you not recall the nights in Montmartre and the days in Montpartre? Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, parbleu! 
When he bent over to kiss Montague again, his mustache fell off. Oh. As usual, Crockett had overplayed. Oh. And before he could straighten up, Bono hit him in the back of the head and he fell flat on his face, out cold. That was my cue to go into action. I turned over the table and wrestled with Horace and Bono while Charmaine was striking at me with the heel of a shoe. I got to the gun first and everything came to a sudden lull. At that point, uh, Fritz Crockett came too. Oh, mes amis... Where did the sudden darkness come from? Yeah, well, you can drop the dialect, Crockett. Oh. I wish I had a picture of you there on the floor for your scrapbook. Oh, it was in the act, Sam, all in the act. Yeah, well, you think you're well enough to hold this gun while I make a search? Oh, leave it to me, Sam. Everything will be under control. Now, stand back, everybody. I'm in charge here. The U.S. government is not entirely without influence in Washington. <laughs> Josephine Crown hidden in the baking oven and called the police. I was afraid the incident struck a blow at Franco-American relations until a search of Charmaine Rouget and Beno produced two tickets not to Paris or Points French, but to Rio de Janeiro. And you know the rest, Mrs. Montague. Your husband went home and you forgave him. He made a superb gesture and contributed to international harmony by returning the Josephine Crown to the French Historical Society. And when you asked who might be the man to guard the crown safely back to La Belle France... I was overjoyed to be in a position to recommend to you Fritz Crockett. I hope he marries uh, Soubrette and stays over there. Period. End of report. Oh, Sam. Isn't that Fritz Crockett an exciting man? Don't let's talk any more about him. Let him get his own program. The first person in his office to mention his name again is a rotten egg. Now, go type that up. Don't buy a different brand of hair tonic for every member of your family. Yet the one kind they all like, Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Get a bottle or tube tonight, and ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Oh, thanks, Sonny. Sam's Great Detective Agency. Oh, it's for you, Sam. Hello. It's me, Sam. Fritz. Oh, no. I'm at the airport. I just wanted to tell you I'll be out of town for a while. Won't be using the office, so just take the whole thing over. Well, that's very generous of you. And you can use Effie if you need her for anything. Well, I'll never be able to repay you. Oh, that's all right. You did a pretty good job on the caper today. Thanks. I was just talking with Mrs. Montague. And I told her, I said, if you I'm want to... I'm looking over. You're not even listening. I've heard enough of him for one day. Come here. Tonight you'll have to be satisfied with my one arm. Oh, that's good enough for me. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, Fred. Good night, 